This is Making a Scientist, the podcast by young scientists for young scientists, featuring cutting edge science and all of the life and work advice that you'll ever need to succeed. It's brought alive by brilliant scientists and hosted by me, Alex Ainsco. How do you get that very first grant as an early career researcher? What goes on behind the scenes from the perspective of grant writing? Well, this week, my guest is Professor Giovanni Mann, who's a professor of vascular physiology at King's College London. Giovanni has served as president of multiple learned societies and has been on the panels for many esteemed funding bodies, including the British Heart Foundation. In this episode, hear Giovanni's advice about grants and grant funding for early career researchers. We also discuss Giovanni's path through the American university system, where he initially studied zoology before he moved to the UK to pursue doctoral and postdoctoral studies in physiology before eventually becoming a professor. There are an awful lot of brilliant nuggets of advice dotted throughout this interview, so keep your ears peeled and let's begin. Giovanni, thank you very much for giving up your time today. Welcome. We're going to start by jumping into the deep end. Just getting a PhD in itself puts you, you know, only, what, 5% of people, let's say, worldwide get a PhD. And of those people who get PhDs, only 0.5% will ever go on to be a professor. You know, that's one one in 200. So I want to, you know, let's be honest. The realistic scientific way, the way of getting a grant is that you must complete the work or part of it, write a grant on that work and pretend you haven't done it yet, get the money for it and then publish it whilst using the new grant money to fund your next grant, if you see what I mean. So you're always sort of like one one behind. So in a broken system such as this, is this really a meritocracy? And how would you go about getting that very first pot of money as a, as a, as a postdoctoral researcher or, or as a fellow? How do you do that? I think at that time, I'll give you a short answer from, from my own experience. As the lecturer, I wrote it around to the MRC. It's one of two MRC grants I've held in my entire career. The first one I wrote was for £24,500 for three years. To work in the pancreas, it was rejected. So there I go, a rejected grant. Quit, go home, become a banker. No, I sat down, I took the comments, I rewrote and resubmitted and got the grant. It was the proudest grant of my life. I had some preliminary data, as we always had to have even then, but I got that grant. And I had written grants before, you know, so I knew how to lay it out, what to structure, all those things. Then let's spool forward to today. Mm -hmm. Fellowship grant, call it Alex's fellowship grant. He's got his background. He's got his supporting mentors. How does he do it? So he lays it out. He lays it out in a certain way, good objectives, everything links. The references are right. It's very neat. The science has to be interesting. The research environment has to be excellent. The training environment has to be excellent. All of that's there. Has he published before? Is this someone who can do well? If it's a fellowship, is he going to be a rising star? And will this person become the next FRS? Almost that. And not everyone gets a fellowship. Giovanni didn't get a fellowship. Yeah, for example, I tried Mm -hmm. for a Lister fellowship, didn't get it. That was it. I didn't stop i carried on yeah some people who are lucky to get fellowships uh, for example could have one or two smaller fellowships and then they're given a three-year university appointment with the idea you will have to write a new investigators grant yeah or we'd like you to apply to the welcome trust dorothy hodgkin or this or this or this competition is huge huge and Mm. rejections are many So if you fall by the wayside because you don't have the stamina, you don't get it. So someone very close to my heart, name is not to be mentioned, um, Mm -hmm. held two fellowships, four rejections for independent, blah, 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 and then received a three-year new investigator award. Very good. Well, congratulations. An example of dedication, yeah? So this is it. It, So so it's it's, it's more this perseverance you must keep keep on trying like res- resilience perseverance and then eventually there's going to be a little bit of serendipity and some someone will give you a chance that's right and you have to also ask your peers and your f- colleagues 
can you read this ground? Does this make sense? Because you'll have had tunnel vision, you know, you, you've you got to get different input. So when I write a ground today, even as a professor, it's read by three or four people in my school and criticized. Mm -hmm. You've got to be able to take criticism. If you cannot in your heart say, I believe in Alex or I believe in myself, then you can't expect your mentor or your boss to believe in you. You've got to have that conviction, not from arrogance, but from self-belief. So that's mm -hmm. my advice to young people. Believe in yourself. The system all over in any business is going to be hard. But if you have the drive, the motivation, the ability to adapt and be flexible, and above all, realize that you can't be a master of all trades. You've got to be able to collaborate. You've got to get yeah. someone interested in your work and say, hey, wow, that makes sense. And it can't be the strap lines. Oh, God, this will have clinical translation. Da, da, da. You know, you've got to be able to at interview, have eye contact and, and radiate the most incredible love for what you're doing. Even if you have four data points, you've got to be able to sell it. You do uh, completely understand. I think that's fantastic advice to, for any for anybody who's listening. As a final year PhD student, I'm certainly gonna gonna take that advice. But then, um, what about the introverts? What about these people who are incredibly gifted, really clever, the next Nobel Prize winner? However, they're not given the chance because they're just a little bit shy, or, or you know, they're just uncomfortable rather than shy. I don't have an answer for that because I feel that if you're fantastic at what you do, let's say, and you're very shy, but your research is so outstanding, you know, that you have your nature, your cell, your embo, whatever, because your research mm -hmm. is so good. But at the end of the day, from my perspective, if you can't speak about your science, yeah, you with me? Yeah. It's difficult because science is there to be disseminated to be and you're going to have to be a mentor of young people. So you're going to have to be able to look at young people and realize they're all different. Some are shy, some are better at this, some are and you're going to have to build them from where they start. So that's been one of my mottos. Never to do, never to do what was done to me. But to do it okay. in a more broad way, like an umbrella. And each of my forty two PhD students were different. Are different. <laughs> And I've learned how to do my best, not always succeeding, never had a failure, but, you know, I've always tried to mentor them. So you've got to learn to sing. Imagine you're a stage actor. Yeah, you can memorize all your lines and you're fantastic and your speaking voice is the best speaking voice ever. But yeah. your facial yeah. expression is that of a dead person. Uh, you, can't, <laughs> you can't be on the stage. And, and that's why when I interview people, I need to see them with others sitting opposite me and yeah. ask them provocative questions to see how would they respond? What will they do? Will they twitch? Because you're investing in that young person. Yeah. And it's, you know, if you're getting yeah. a million pound grant or 800,000, you want to know that that person can deliver, will deliver, won't give up. Yeah. Definitely. Well, just, just on a little bit of a tangent then, but that must have been quite difficult to do during pandemic times. You won't be able to pick up on these cues. I mean, obviously everybody's life has changed, and, you know, uh, incredibly since uh, this time last sure. year, but that must have, that must it's have been, been very, uh, it, it's been almost impossible. And I really, the way I work, you're in my office and we talk and we can see each other, you know, we cross collaborate and doing it on teams with multiple little screens is not the same. And so the it's research not. output has been slowed, um, grants have been held up, reagents couldn't be ordered. It, it's not been right. But but take it from a positive side. It's, it's made the students more self-reliant. They have bonded more the ones that are at work. So that's that's important. Yeah. And I sort of, yeah. for the past sort of 15, well, 12, 15 years, have insisted that students maintain a, a what I call a working thesis folder. So they start on day one writing the table of contents. So all my students have their thesis up and written already. So when they arrive at your stage, Alex, there's virtually mm. nothing to write. It is basically, oh, God. To, it, it's basically <laughs> to write the paper or papers, the review. And that's important. So, yeah. If I were your age, or I was 18, yeah, and I didn't even have the wisdom I have now, the experience, I would do it all again, even with COVID. I would want even to do this way. because yeah. it's important if you are competitive and you want to be better than your best mate. I'm not yes. that kind of a person, I hope. I am competing with myself. 
And I yes. need to know that I've done the best I can so that I don't end my career saying, oh, my God, why wasn't I this? Why didn't I get that honor? And, you know, the little name. I've never chased the name badge. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. I want to be mm-hmm. known for what I did, for how I mentored people, for being a motivator, if you wish, not a demotivator. And, <laughs> you know, I'm 70 years old and I want to be remembered for being an enthusiast and that, yeah. you know, something excites me. Yesterday I heard a lecture by a colleague at, at King's and he spoke about the most fantastic study of the virus invading a pneumocyte and raising calcium in the pneumocyte and finding drugs that are up on the shelf already that prevent this. He gave such a good lecture. I was inspired. He's my colleague. It could be you. It could be anyone. It's because it was delivered in a modest and yet informed, elegant way. And the science led to a Nature paper and a PNAS paper within one year. I mean, it was just wow. breathtaking, but it wasn't done alone. He had multiple no. collaborators, you know, and his five postdocs worked day and night because they were driven by the project. So I think yeah. that's what you need to do and you will succeed as a young scientist. So let's start right at the beginning. Where were you born? Where did you grow up? And where did you go to school? Uh, I was born in London, believe it or not, even though I have an American accent. So I was born on the 2nd of February, 1951 in Mortlake. And my mother uh, was the daughter of a Czech man, a businessman and a German mother. And they lived in Prague and then came the war. And my grandfather fled to England to escape the Nazis. And my grandmother took her two daughters to Germany and they were under the protection of her father, their grandfather. After the war in Wiesbaden, Germany, where they lived, my mother, sister and grandmother went to England to see their father, who had now joined the English National Support Service. My mother was very young. She met my father in Mortlake and lo and behold, I arrived. And so I was in London for a year, and then I went back to Germany with my mother and father and grandmother and grew up in Wiesbaden for 18 years. So I never came back to Britain, really, except for holidays and seeing things. And in Germany, I attended American schools. That was for the military forces at the time to learn English. As a child, my native language was German and French, though my French is very weak nowadays. I can understand it. And but are you tri- so? Are you a trilingual man? You speak German, French, and English. Yes, I do. Wow, uh, I, would, I never I knew that say, about you. That's awesome. I would say that I'm bilingual in English and German. French, I will not profess to know. <laughs> but <laughs> fair enough. After after my my elementary school, my middle school, and American high school, I applied for university in the United States. And that was an interesting thing to do. Yeah, why did you apply in the United States? Germany has plenty of good universities. I didn't go to a German gymnasium, which is the equivalent of the American high school. So my whole friendship, my whole ethos was sort of focused on America. I'd never been to America in my life. And when we chose schools, I applied to the Ivy League schools. And one of them, which was not an Ivy League school, was George Washington University interesting way to apply in those days you had a light box and on to which you laid papers with holes in it co-ed um, science-based whatever and then you circled the light that was free and you applied it, it cut a long story short i ended up at george washington university doing a pre-clinical what they call basic science degree and there you had to specialize in a BSc. It, did, it wasn't like here where you entered into physiology or biochemistry, etc. It was preclinical biomedical sciences. And I chose zoology as a major. Uh, okay. Why zoology? I don't know. I like the animal kingdom. I like classifications. I was a bit of a nerd. Anyway, I got a degree in a BSc with a major in zoology in America, applied for university Uh, postgraduate studies in America at that time. I also had applied to the UK because my father was an English citizen. I was a British citizen born in London and I applied to UCL and I can't remember some others and I wanted to study medicine. 
So I arrived in London uh, for an interview. Uh, well, it didn't arrive. I drove to UCL to see if I could apply for medicine because I didn't know. Okay. Any, I knew nothing about UCAS or any of that and got an interview with the dean of medicine. And she said, frankly, young man, you haven't got a chance. George Washington, what is that? Uh, Stanford, Cornell, Harvard, we may make an exception. But anyway, at UCL, fortuitously, I walked in the quad inside the campus and I saw the Institute of Physiology, that very famous set of steps that wind up into the department. And I said, you know, I really like physiology and how the body works. So in I went, had an interview with a man called um, Jim Pascoe. He... How did you go about setting that interview up? Um, I walked in. Did you just contact him? No. Oh, I you walked in? Walked into the department and said, look, okay. I'm, here, I'm here from the United States. I'm here on a short visit. I've just been told no chance in medicine. Uh, is there any opportunity to apply for um, an MSc in physiology? See, now that's fascinating. I mean, especially nowadays, what people will try and do is to drop an email, but there's thousands of people who are emailing big professors and you essentially, back in the day, just went and made it happen. You just went to their office and practically you, you demanded an interview almost. Yes, well, I didn't demand, but Alex, there were no, <laughs> there were no emails and mobiles in those days. And, and, I yes. also, and I also didn't have the name and I hadn't had the contacts in the UK. So because I did zoology, I went in and we were just talking about PhDs and he interviewed me. Just a very nice guy. Just on, just just on, on the, the spot. spot. And he said, look, your background is zoology. Uh, I tell you what, the MSc places in those days, you know, I don't know if there were scholarships for MSCs, but he said, look, the tuition fees are this. Um, I suggest you do a one year MSc, see how you fit into the British system. And from there you can do your PhD. So. Off I went back to the United States, finished my BSc um, and started in September 1973 at UCL. And in my MSc year, which was really quite fortuitous and interesting, were the following colleagues, Jonathan Ashmore, Malcolm Irving, just to name two FRSs. Giovanni's not an FRS. So I had yet, a fantastic... No, 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 never. <laughs> I had a fantastic class of six. And in those days, the MSCs were very loosely structured. You, you, got, you got assigned to a supervisor and you took some final year BSc courses. Now, I took a course in what they called, I think it was called vascular or cardiovascular physiology uh, with hands-on experiments working with you know, animals that were anesthetized, etc. And I took a neuroscience option just to spread myself a bit thinner and then did a eight, nine month lab project to look at the effects of microvascular permeability in a rodent model uh, using histamine as inflammatory mediator and then watching red cells pack down and measure the capillary filtration coefficient. Because of that time, I had never been in Britain, never educated in Britain. I didn't have the same, if you wish, intense background that is, you know, a-level student would have had or undergraduate student in the UK, i.e. no literature, no books, you know, just science all the way through. So that was very important for me to have and, and acclimatize. And uh, the project I did, and I always tell my PhD students and my BSCs and MSCs, at the end of eight months, my MSC thesis had four numbers. Not an N of four, just four single numbers, measurements. And that was my okay. MSc because the prep was hard. It wasn't that I was incapable. It was just a hard prep and fighting to get those four numbers without a PC, you know, typing it myself. No PowerPoint, nothing was there. Uh, I think I always tell my students, I think that's why I'm here today because I love to challenge. I love to troubleshoot. So that was my MSc at UCL. So I think that's really important as well, because if you didn't have that real passion or resilience to to follow through with writing up these data points, then you, you wouldn't do it. So I wonder how many people these days, if, you know, if, if, if we didn't have computers, I know I'd certainly really, really struggle. Uh, if if we if we would have the same drive and determination to want to do that, so I think that's quite an important lesson for anybody who is uh, a BSc student or an MSc student who's who's listening to this, and that would be that 
you, whatever you are looking at doing, you must, 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 must have that drive, have that determination. Otherwise, it's a non-starter. And, you know, maybe I can put that into some context. I don't think I give myself all the credit because I was at UCL in an environment that was, that's not there today. You see, we're all in research silos, research schools, research groupings, you know, in little segments. At UCL, there was, in physiology, very closely linked to anatomy at that time, a tea room called the Starling Room. And somewhere around quarter okay. to 11, 11, everyone just sort of migrated there and would have tea. Very modest tables, very cramped. English tea, as you know, some instant coffee. And students would give seminars. And that taught me in a way that the research even that you do is never perfect, can always be improved and enhanced, and you should not feel overwhelmed by the question, I have a reservation about the interpretation of that graph or whatever. You should rise to the challenge. So I had an environment at UCL where, truthfully, at that time, that was my life. I mean that honestly. I would come at eight and I would leave at midnight. And that could be seven days a week. And everything else around my life fitted around that. And by the way, everyone else was there. It was just what you did. There were no progress reports. There were no, well, let's see if you can pass. No one... You were just there to sink or swim, and you were given help if you ask for it. So, do you think that the um, th that way of doing things is, I don't know, almost like a uh, a way that can hammer out the really defined people as opposed to these days where it you know everything is structured. We have these progress reports. You know, for me, I have to write a six monthly sure. one for my department. Um, do you think that it's actually a, a negative thing? No, I, I think uh, I, I'll answer two ways. One is, I think, for me at the time, it was what formed me because of my personality and the way I am. There were some who didn't make it, i.e. they needed more structure. Had I had more structure or been, been given, you know, read these two papers, don't go to the library. In those days, you had to go to the library and touch journals. You know, you actually had to see them. They weren't on PubMed. Mm -hmm. And you had a little book that was called <laughs> Current Contents, where you could look up thematic things like you do keywords. And I, I'm going to say this at the front of this interview. People always argue with me and don't believe me. When I was there, I never, ever sat down and contemplated, OK, if I do this, then I get that. Now, then I'll be a professor. Then I'll be this. Then I'll be that. Never. What was ahead of me was day by day, can I do that experiment? What will the data show? Gosh, that's interesting. How should I do some tangential experiment? So it was very, very different. And if I needed a piece of equipment made, we had a, a workshop in the basement. I could go down with my supervisor's blessing, design something. It was made for me. I didn't have to pay it. I didn't have to have a grant code, you see. And mm. it was just different. And it's what made me. And if I could give to you and our my young students, that environment, that would be fantastic. So when it came to choosing your, your PhD, um, what was your thought process behind uh, choosing this PhD? I had done my MSc sort of in vascular permeability. I was at the time at UCL and a Chilean professor had come after the coup in, in Chile, had arrived at UCL and was associated with Hugh Daxon at that time. I met him. He made close friendship with my supervisor, Lawrence Smage, who ended up being my PhD supervisor. And Lawrence's background had been working in the salary gland. And he sort of asked me, how about you, Giovanni, learning how to perfuse the salary gland in vivo and do some indicator dilution that's injecting into the arterial supply five different isotope markers and measuring the permeability of the blood vessels that are fenestrated and look at secretion and duct ligation. I said that sounded fine. I, I felt relaxed. You know, it was an MRC studentship. But I also had always wanted to go to Cambridge. So I did have some weird inkling that, hmm, maybe you should go to this institution. And sure enough, I had an interview in Cambridge. I won't say with whom. I was offered another MRC studentship there. And as I was finished the interview, I was asked, can you sign on the dotted line? And I had said, oh, excuse me, do you think I could make an academic decision? Because I also have an offer at UCL. And the person there in Cambridge said, 
why are you wasting my time? And that was yeah. my, and, uh, wait, that was my decision. And as I was walked out, as I was walked out of the interview room, another person I won't mention, very nice, said Giovanni, look, the difference between Cambridge and UCL is is marginal, um, and you go where your heart is and 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 follow your follow your thoughts. Had I gone to Cambridge, I would have ended up doing research that I did later in my life. Sorry, I was just wondering, do you think that supervisor, um, obviously, yeah, we're not mentioning any names, but do you think that reaction perhaps revealed that you made the right decision? Uh, if, oh, yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I would never have, we would have killed each other. So you have to remember <laughs> that that I wasn't the typical UK uh, young investigator. Yeah, I was, I don't know if the, I, I, I would call myself headstrong and enthusiastic. Others would have said, you know, he's a little bit pushy. I don't know the answer. You know, in my old age, is it a good quality to be a little bit pushy? With would... hindsight, the, the quality would have been excellent in the United States. The quality is not a good quality in the UK because uh, so... I was too headstrong, perhaps. But if there was a problem and and you couldn't help me, Alex, or if someone couldn't, I would find a way to get help, and it would happen. Yeah. And so. I was only interested in people that had an interest. And I think that behavior, doing it on my own, with hindsight, I should have said, perhaps Lawrence, should I do this? Or, you know, I should have asked for, not permission, but whatever you want to call it. I wonder whether you think that this tactic is, is successful for PhD, MSc, postdoc students now, these days. What, what do you think? I, I think, if, if, if you gave students advice today, uh, come up with the idea, it's original, you know, go and discuss it with your supervisors, get their blessing, you know, oh, that's a good idea. Do you mind if I contact? If it were me, I said, look, um, do you know so-and-so? They say no. I said, would you like me to help? I would do that. But then I would go with the student. And sometimes supervisors today, some of them may be a bit, more, not possessive, but feel they would like to take the initiative. Yeah, yes. and, in the, and in the old days, a PhD was your making. It, it wasn't like we say a contract today, 50-50. This was you being taken on by a person who trusted in you to deliver. But if you didn't deliver and couldn't complete, uh, it wasn't a black mark on their book. Whereas today, we cannot really afford to take on MRC, BBSRC students and not mentor them in the right way and allow them to fail. I mean, we shouldn't be doing that. And... There were, I don't know if there were less PhDs, but certainly there were less scholarships. And in those days, my stipend, my annual stipend, was £975. Pounds. Wow. Back in, <laughs> back in 1974. So, 74, 75, 76, 77. So, it, it, it was just a different environment. And so, you didn't mind working till 10 at night. It, it wasn't, oh my gosh, I've got to go have a social life. And... I don't know how many of my colleagues at that time actually ever thought about, will I have a family? Will I have a television? Will I have a car? Will I have a... I don't know. Because I, that never was discussed by myself with my colleagues. So I'd like to, I'd like to ask you a personal question then, if I may. And, sure. And we, can, you know, we can always edit it, this bit out afterwards. Um, but if you were working kind of burning the candle at both ends and you didn't have so much time for a personal life or a social life, what, how did that affect you with your, your friendships or, or relationships? Okay, good question. Uh, my friends were at the university. So I made my best friend, who's still one of my best friends, he was a fellow PhD. And after the, okay. you know, working at 10, we'd go to a Chinese restaurant on Tottenham Court Road full of cockroaches and have dinner. And we had a flat together. <laughs> we were, we were good, we were good, you know, we made good mates and good friends there. And the reason really I stayed at UCL besides the Cambridge interview, I had just met my wife as a girlfriend and she had come from Cambridge and was in London and she was interesting uh, she's english but more i would say european in her way of behavior we became really good friends so i would work till late at night and at midnight len would come and we'd finish off the pipetting and we'd go for dinner it was a different life naturally i needed my students my postdocs my my colleagues to guide and help me and mentor me all along but the energy 
came and I, I, I think I told you this once, I was interviewed once for a chair and um, I was asked by the vice chancellor, what are your weaknesses? Yeah, that's a good question. I often ask that in interview. Yeah, yeah. And, and yeah. I said, that's a very good question. I said, my response may surprise you. And I said, my weakness is my enthusiasm because I have so much energy that I often see myself demotivating my stuff. In other words, I have more energy than I should have had. And he smiled and he smiled. So that was a way of not saying, oh gosh, I can't write or I can't do bioinformatics, you know. And, and I believe that I have a lot of energy and you know, I'm mature now and much more mellow since the age of 47. Um, but um, up to 47, I, I was quite an energetic character and trying to link fields together, you know, and, yeah, inter and yeah. interested in many things. So whereas other colleagues of mine were very laser beamed, you know, in one small field. And, you know, I, I moved around and followed my interests. I think to be able to follow your heart and then the money following is, I think that's the right way to do it because a lot of people who graduate from, from universities now, and it's partly because of the, the financial climate, but you will look for jobs. Like I, for, so personally, I don't mind revealing that after I did my MSc, I, um, I, I applied for quite a few jobs that were relatively high paying. I looked at some in the banking industry. Uh, I, apply, I applied for Lloyd's. I applied for um, a, a couple of others. But the, the the idea was that I thought that because I'd never really had much money as an MSc student, that money would make me make me happier. But I, I found that, so I actually did, I, I found another job and uh, it was a fantastic company and I worked there for six months. But what I personally found was that I wasn't uh, stimulated and I didn't feel like I was getting paid well. But I didn't feel like I was I was stimulated in, in the way that I wanted to be. So I, I learned the lesson there that it's very important to to follow what you love and, and, and you and you learned it too. And also, I suppose, very, very important to have a supportive spouse um, or, or wife or partner. I think that the, the concept of money, yes, it was always important. But, you know, Alex, in those days, my, my stipend was less and everything was less. You know, I paid rent living in Queen Anne Street just off Oxford Street in a in a solicitor's building, elegant, but not furnished, only furnished with mattresses and things. But I paid nine pounds rent a week. But it was a good balance, you know, and um, mm. I'm not saying select your partner to support you because it's you have to support each other. You know, they're, yes. they're different. You can't just be one sided. You stayed at UCL to do postdoctoral research. No, I stayed at UCL, finished my PhD, and I needed a postdoc. Yes, but, okay. But, you know, did I think about that? No, I ended up saying, oh, gosh, the PhD is finished. What are we going to do now? And David Udilovich said, um, well, I have a four-year fellowship at Queen Elizabeth College as the professor. Would you like this? I said, I asked Lawrence, he said, yeah, he, why don't you go? And so he took me over and I went over for tea at Queen Elizabeth College. And he had, in those days, he had a little office in a blackboard with chalk. And he, he made, he made, and he was a friend. So we made the tea. It's a very British way of doing things over, over, over tea. Go, go to the blackboard for a moment. I said, can I finish my tea? So I finished the tea. He said, go to the blackboard and just summarize what you think you're going to do during your four-year fellowship with me. So off I went and wrote, you know, I had ideas and thought everything I said, he went, oh, no, oh, no, no, <laughs> rubbish. So after about three hours of this, uh, I was feeling completely deflated, totally. I don't know what, what happened. I thought I was going for tea and to sign on the dotted line. But he went. And you just getting torn to pieces. He, 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 he wiped the floor with me. And so I left his office, went back to UCL immediately to Lawrence May and I said, Lawrence, I don't know what I just went through, but it was horrible. I don't think I can do this. I think this is, it would kill me. And so in the end, I did do it. And everything I'd written on the blackboard, everything, he let me do. Oh, really? That's really nice. Oh, yes. It was yeah. just, he never spoke about it, but I did everything. And he just said to me, he said, Giovanni, from the day you arrived in my office for tea, you were very, very pushy. And I, need, <laughs> and I needed to let you know who's the boss. I said, okay.
the supervisor of yours. He sounds like a very uh, a very uh, like big uh, feature in your in your life. He 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 sounds like he almost molded and shaped you. He taught you how to write grants. He taught, yeah. I mean that worked very well, and so I grew up a lot. So by thirty one thereabouts. Uh, fortuitously a lectureship came up at Queen Elizabeth College in physiology and literally just happened and not I didn't even see it or apply. and David said why don't you apply so I applied uh, cut that story short I, I was interviewed got the lectureship but at interview I was asked by my later to be head of school at King's Mm -hmm. uh, how are you going to dissociate your research from that of Professor David Judilovich by taking this lectureship that was my question at interview it's a good question. Very good question. And my answer at that time was, I said, uh, David Judilovich and I have worked together for the past six years through my PhD and, and this fellowship. I think we've been successful. Could we have been more successful? Absolutely. I've managed to, with his mentorship, find a niche of research in the pancreas that is complementary but distinct from his. And I foresee no problems in continuing this successful research collaboration. So in those days, I knew that collaboration was critical and I wasn't, mm -hmm. I didn't know that today the Wellcome Trust and everyone would like the young guy or the young lady to be independent, da, 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 da. And so mm. that was asking me then. And that's my answer. So the, so the two most important things then would be uh, to maintain collaboration links and also very importantly to find your niche because your, your niche you have to become this this go-to person in something right if you're not the go-to person then from a from a college or from a university standpoint why, why would we hire you yeah what was your most memorable experience out of everything what's the what's the one memory that just sticks out most in your mind i'm a fellow at Queen Elizabeth College with David Udilovich and mm -hmm. um, 10 years after my PhD, so it will have been 1980, no, I would have been a lecturer, 1988, so 10 years after my PhD, there was a figure in my PhD on the binding of vitamin B12 to the epithelium and the perfused salivary gland, uh, okay. without more detail. One figure, that figure became the basis of a paper for a book chapter that I wrote 10 years later, but the leading up to that figure was a six-hour discussion in David Udilovich's office with wine, <laughs> cheese, an interruption, a dinner, coming back. That was his most enthusiastic celebration of a piece of data, a piece of data. And that sticks in my mind, and I share the same, and I share this figure when I interview PhD students as what one can do with a piece of data from one experiment. <laughs> wow. Okay, um, what has been the highlight of your career? Truthfully, there are two stages. One, that I succeeded as a young person in getting grants, in writing papers, in getting promoted, although I didn't seek in advance, as I said to you, this promotional mm -hmm. track. But the latter part of my career, sort of from the age of 45 onwards, was that I could turn out to be a good mentor for many, many different type of young people. And so when I lecture to the students or when I give a seminar, I sort of, I'm not like a dame with a musical voice, but I can intonate and, and act. And I think partly disseminating your research or your science, it takes a skill of being able to speak. And when I was very young, early teens, I, I didn't have this capacity. I didn't have the ability. I was very shy. I would get very trembly. And, you know, today, even if you give a lecture, if I give a lecture or a communication at a meeting or a plenary lecture or whatever, I, I still feel nervous. But so how, how do you get over that kind of uh, the fear of public speaking or anxiety? I think it sort of goes by the first slide. You know, I sort of zone in and uh, I don't memorize anything, you know. So as a, as a youngster at, at high school, I didn't have a photographic memory, but I could see whole pages of text. That's not being very intelligent. I could regurgitate that page, but if I read three pages of text from three different sources, and you asked me, could you integrate the three? Uh, I couldn't easily. 
So See, I, th- yeah, that's that, that's really interesting, just because of the way that exams are kind of structured at the moment, and that that is uh, maybe something that needs to be addressed on on a more national scale. But the the way that high school exams or A level exams or university exams, it's often it's often just that you need to you need to remember this text from a textbook, and then there it is in the in the in the exam. But what I then learned to do, uh, this is a funny story. I was assigned as a PhD student to to take a medical tutorial, you know, first year medics at UCL. And I never forget my first tutorial. I felt, you know, I'm a PhD. I feel very good and I'll do this, mm-hmm. no problem. And it was on the action potential. Yeah, pretty straightforward. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, th- unfortunately, they knew more than I did. So, <laughs> so I said, okay, we're going to cancel this tutorial, but behold, this will never happen again. So from then on, every tutorial, I was prepared. I knew what was going on. I knew I was dealing with really intelligent medical students, and I had a great time. But then I realized that the only way to teach from a research-led position is Mm -hmm. to become comfortable with your way of teaching. And so I teach from a lot of schematics, a lot of models that I can get from textbooks or papers. I don't have any notes. There are no notes written. You know, I can do it just by looking at the picture and having rehearsed it once or twice without memorizing. Okay, last couple of questions. This is this is one of my favorite ones to ask. What was the hardest decision of your career? The hardest decision of the heart, yeah. So perhaps, perhaps you you had a time when you felt like you were quitting. Perhaps you had a time when you felt. To be honest with you, the hardest decision of my career, or that needed a lot of reshaping of my way of doing what I do, was at age forty-seven. I had been a an over enthusiast, and I realized that was not the best way to behave. And I realized that with a bit more mellowness and a bit more counting to 10 before you go and not to fight too many battles even if you believed in every single one of them to limit what you do to be strategic about your decisions and then I wanted to become a better mentor of my young people and I think truthfully I've achieved that so that was hard how to change your whole approach to science and that happened Alex at 47 when I got my chair on that day I mean that way had worked for you for so long, so I, I yeah I can I can I can imagine that it's something that's given you so much success to be able to to change it is different. But then I suppose it's almost a different attitude that you need to get to be a professor than the attitude when you actually are a professor. You know, it, it, you you've almost won in some respects. You've got the you've got the professorship. You've you know you've you, you've achieved that goal that most PhD students. Are after and yeah, it, it then comes it then starts to be more about helping others rather than competing. So for sure, what would your top work life balance advice? Be? Whilst you need to have focus to succeed as a young investigator, you know, going up and getting your PhD, your postdoc, your first position, etc. I think it's really important, maybe not to do quite what I did, which is immerse myself completely in the scientific side at the expense of everything else. I, I think that that is one thing that I would try to develop further outside interests. So if you are interested in art or music, to have something that distracts you from just science. Yeah, if you like literature, learn that. Yeah. And so late in life, I, you know, you know, I like music, I like the ballet, I like many things. and. Uh, but am I an expert in anything else? No. And honestly, Alex, am I an expert in science? Who knows? You know, I don't profess to be an expert in anything. But if you give me a subject and I'm excited by what you did, I will immediately go and research that field, get some information and roll yeah. if I can. And it <laughs> takes just, I have an example. I, I, I work with a group at King's, the London Metalomics facility. A lovely young lady there is the managing director of the facility. And she comes in one day and says, Giovanni, have you ever thought of doing this? I don't want to say what this is, but I said, no, mm-hmm. what is this? I said, oh, okay, I'll, I'll think about it. Then I quickly looked it up and said, this is incredible. 
I've got some sections from Stroke Brains. Can we do this? Yep, off we went. And lo and behold, that's going to be a grant. And so this was just a castaway sentence in my office, but she was sparkling. I looked in her eyes and I said, wow, this goes, this is ready to, I knew nothing about the technique, the nothing, but I was able with PubMed within about 20 minutes to pull five, six key papers and say, yes, I understand. So that kind of development is good. But if I could broaden my horizon or have broadened it to do something else, you know, that is not the science, you know, that gives you yeah. breath, that I think is a good piece of advice. Definitely. Investing your time in the right things is very, is very, very important. And, and everybody will make, or in retrospect, everybody will, will always have a, oh, I could have done this differently. I could have done that, that differently. So you also have to also almost not be too hard on yourself sometimes, but definitely maybe, maybe it's worth just whatever stage you're, you're at, it's maybe just worth Am I invest thinking? Am I investing my time correctly now, as I see it, and do I think that I benefit from that in in five or ten years? So, um, the the very final question I'd like to ask, because well, you've already answered my question. If you do it all over again, would, would you keep the same, and what would you change? You you keep it all the same, um, pretty much. But then the very final question I'd like to ask is 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 more of a forecast question. So, in science in general. Which emerging trend do you see as having the greatest potential to affect any sort of change? I think at the moment what I would say is, you know, during the years there's been the cell physiology, the cellular investigation, the in vivo investigation, the linking of the two mm -hmm. together, the inclusion of genetics, right, and yeah. molecular biology. But if you yeah. just take COVID-19, the CRISPR, the RNA vaccines, wow. There's something that really took off and is helping. Forget about the paper in nature. This is helping, man, this is helping mankind. There's something where science has made such incredible advances and it needed all those basic techniques. And, and you know, and the Nobel Prize was given for it. And if you think about that, mm. mutations are happening, but they can deal with it. Do you understand with the technology? That technology mm. is incredible. Now, can you be a molecular biologist, a bioinformaticist, an in vivo guy, uh, organ on a chip guy, everything? <laughs> if I gave you, if I gave you right now a million pounds and you had a postdoc and a technician and you were a fellow, you would find it daunting, Alex, because you would have to direct the research lead the research, write reports on the research, uh, deal with the personalities that you've hired, uh, mm. make sure that the questions you've been funded to do make sense and are still pertinent. It's hard. And so you need to have an infrastructure of collaborators that, you, that, that support you and believe in you so that you're not saying, yes, I'm alone, I'm ready to run. Because it's very hard to do it alone. And science is not about becoming the professor or the chair in Cambridge or Harvard, it is not about that. It is about making a contribution and answering your own scientific questions and being proud of what you've written and done, not what your neighbor has done. But there are many people, young and old, who are competing. And you know that and I know that. And the thing is, exactly. the, best, the best advice I have is compete with yourself don't be so hard on yourself, like you said. And above all, radiate love for what you do so that when you have your own team, they'll say, hey, Alex was a good guy. That's what's important. Hopefully so. So you mentioned how busy you are. Thank you so much for giving up your time to, to be on this podcast. I hope everyone has learned something today. Uh, Giovanni, thank you very much. Thank you for interviewing me. I think Giovanni puts it really nicely. Success is going from failure to failure without losing optimism or hope. I really want to thank him for giving up his time to do this podcast because navigating grant writing is an incredibly difficult thing and he gave some really sound advice as to how to go about it. When it comes to grants, I think it's always worth remembering that you shouldn't necessarily take failure personally. There are so many talented scientists with equally good proposals. The next episode is going to be released on Wednesday the 30th of June and it's going to feature Dr. Nazreen Alwan where we will talk all about public health and long COVID, which is particularly topical right now. 
As always, please make sure you keep subscribing and following us on Twitter and YouTube, and rate us on your podcast platform because this helps us out a huge, huge deal. Until next time.